I'm here in Southern California today to look at a water-loving tree. Now that doesn't make sense right off the bat, right? I mean, just looking around the landscape that I'm standing in today, this is what we call a chaparral environment. It's a habitat where the plants are adapted to live in these warm, sizzling summers and not much precipitation in the wintertime either. A lot of the plants that we're going to see around here are going to be shrubs like this one next to me that are low growing, slow growing, fire adapted, and not something that we'd necessarily describe as water loving. Now the tree that we're going to be looking for has adapted to live in what we call a riparian habitat. And this is one of the tricks that that water lover uses to be able to survive in this rather harsh environment. Even though I'm just a couple hundred feet from the Pacific Ocean right now as I'm filming, this is a case of water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink, unless you know where to get it. We're gonna take a look at that special tree now. I'm out here today with my friend, the California sycamore tree, sometimes called the Western sycamore tree. Now I know what you're probably thinking, this doesn't look like a tree, it looks like organic fat-free milk. But if you look closely, you will notice a small tree sapling growing out of this carton of organic fat-free milk. Now, this tree is a little bit small because it's a baby, but in its natural habitat, the California sycamore tree actually often grows to be taller than any other trees in its home range. Because size is a hard way to tell trees apart, let's learn how we can identify the California sycamore if we encounter it in the wild. And now time to reveal how to find a California sycamore in its natural habitat. So first identification feature we're gonna go over is gonna be the leaves and leaf shape, leaf color, all that fun jazz. So this leaf right here is what we would call a palmate leaf. Now that's because it looks kind of like the palm of your hand. It has fingers, we would call those lobes if we're talking about trees botanically. And you'll notice first that these leaves are of different sizes. They can range from the size of a couple inches across right up to the size of a large dinner plate on the California sycamore. And these leaves are gonna be this light green color with a le leathery texture. And they're also gonna have this kind of velvety fuzz all over them. And you can rub it off if you take your finger to it, but they're gonna feel very soft, almost like toilet paper when you put your hands on them. Now another feature of this tree that can help you identify them are gonna be the seed pods. And not all trees will have them all the time, but you're gonna be looking for these um, things that are about the size and shape of a gumball, and they're gonna dangle down from the tree on long strands. And when you break them open, you'll find that it's actually a whole bunch of tiny little seeds clustered together at the center, and then attached to um, these little things like daffodil fluff that help them float away in the wind or float on water. Now the final feature of identifying a sycamore tree and probably the most distinctive is going to be the bark of this tree. The bark of a sycamore tree is kind of like a puzzle piece mosaic. When it's young, it's gonna be very smooth and constantly exfoliating, little pieces of bark falling off. The older pieces are gonna be kind of this grayish to tan color. And as they fall away, they're gonna reveal a patchwork of kind of light greens and whites underneath. Um, so an extremely beautiful artistic tree. As they get a little bit older, um, that, that youthful kind of smooth and puzzle piece look is gonna fade away and be replaced by this kind of uh, dark gray gnarled bark as you'd expect on a lot of older trees. So a couple of different things that you might find with that, but even on those older trees, the upper branches are still gonna be covered with that smooth puzzle piece bark that's identifiable even from a far distance. Now that we know what we're looking for, let's get out there in the wild and see this tree in its natural habitat. So sycamore trees, they love water. But that's a little bit confusing because these trees also have a range that runs from Northern California in the Central Valley and the coast ranges all the way down to Baja California in Mexico. Now most of you probably know that this is a pretty arid region of the Western coast, what we call a Mediterranean climate. So what's a water loving tree like you doing in a dry place like this? Well the answer has to do with the habitat that California sycamores are specialized to live in, and that's the riparian habitat, which we mentioned at the beginning of this video, is the habitat right around streams, creeks, waterways of any kind. And so this tree here has adapted to live close to water. You're gonna generally find them grouped right in that riparian habitat and not out in the open. So this tree's habitat is gonna be kind of these long chains along rivers, rather than a continuous forest spreading in between them. 
Now, there's a couple adaptations that help this tree to survive in that habitat through the disturbances that are brought on by streams and rivers. And disturbances here is usually going to be something like a flood that comes through. We're gonna talk a little bit about how this tree is perfect for living in a riparian habitat. All right, the first adaptation survival trait that we will be talking about for the western sycamore is going to be the seed pods here. It's important to be able to reproduce if your species is going to survive. Now these seed pods, they're kind of cute. They look like little puff balls on the end of a stick. Usually there's multiple puff balls on the same stick, but the trait of these seeds that will help them in this riparian habitat is that they are teeny weeny little and attached to that cottony fluff stuff. So when this fluff stuff is picked off and scattered in the wind, it will oftentimes drop down into the stream because of course riparian areas are defined by their streams. Now, um, the fluffy bits on here will allow those seeds to float downstream. The benefit of that being that these seeds will often find themselves deposited on the bank of a stream. And this is a water loving tree, remember. So when those seeds are deposited there, um, they are able to access that water immediately, which again is good because they are very small. They need to get their roots down quickly or they are going to dry out and die. Um, and so that gives the sycamore, western sycamore, an advantage in spreading its seeds in these riparian habitats. Survival trait number two, we're going to be looking at the bark of the sycamore tree. Now, we've already talked about how this bark makes these beautiful textures as it peels away, revealing layers underneath. But why would a tree do that, right? After all, the bark is the protective layer. It's what keeps things from getting into the living layer we call the cambium, which is just inside of the bark. Well, the reason that sycamores have peely bark is trees are rooted in place. So if they have a parasite or an insect or something that starts trying to grow on their bark or get into them from the bark, they can't just waltz on down to the local pharmacy and get some kind of cream to put on it. Instead, they need to get rid of that parasite. And the way they do that, is by shedding it and dropping it to the ground. So having constantly peeling bark, especially in a wet place like a riparian area where you might find fungal infections fairly commonly is a good adaption trait. And additionally, these trees don't quite need the super thick bark that a lot of trees in California have to survive wildfires for the simple reason that they like to live in these wetter areas that are gonna be a little bit less prone to fire. And if a fire does come along, these trees can just sprout right back up from the roots if the upper part is destroyed. More on that later when we talk about sucker growth. And so we arrive at our final adaptation that's going to help the western sycamore survive in a riparian habitat. Now you might notice that some of these branches here coming off of the trunk do so almost horizontally, very close to the ground, and actually they dip down to the ground. Now why would the trees do that? Why would you want to have your branches falling down onto the ground? We're going to go and check out where they hit and take a look at the process known as layering. So we've arrived at the place where the branch that I was standing on has dove into the ground right here. Now what's happening here is layering and layering is a form of clonal reproduction. What it means is that the big tree behind me is producing a genetically identical offspring by sending this branch into the ground where it will send out new roots and then pop back up into this tree right here, which is a new tree. It can live by itself even if this larger sycamore behind me dies because it has its own root system now, but it's a genetic clone of the original tree, which means even if that original tree dies, the organism lives on. It kind of begs the question of, is this a new tree? Is it the same as the old tree, right? Um, so a really fascinating form of reproduction here known as layering. A lot of trees in riparian areas will practice this. Um, it's particularly handy if you want to spread up and down an area with a lot of water to have your branches go back into the soil and offer another chance at more roots because these roots are also helping the mother tree survive at this point as long as it's with us as well. So similar to the layering propagation of sycamore trees is another type of clonal propagation where you end up with a clone of the original mother tree. Now each one of these small branches around me here is coming out of the root ball of an existing sycamore behind me. And this ancient tree has been here for a long time, but if it were to collapse from the main trunk, there's a good chance that one of these smaller branches here grouped around its base would grow up into a full-size tree and the organism would live on. 
Now this is very handy if you're a tree that grows in a place like a riparian ecosystem that could flood and knock down the main trunk of your tree. It's also handy in a place like California where fires do come through very frequently because it's a dry place. And in the case of the sycamore, those fires often will kill the existing trunk, but Again, this tree can come right back from the roots, grow a new trunk, and survive on for centuries more. So how can we find connection through this tree through human uses for it? Well, we can start out with the people who have known this tree the longest, the indigenous people of California, who have for thousands of years used this tree as a source of medicine, as a source of uh, wood for fuel, for construction materials, and as a starvation food, because the inner bark of this tree, even though it has some nutritional value to it, uh, doesn't taste very good, but if you were starving, you would want to eat it. Now, uh, another traditional use that is particularly local to this area right here, the Chumash Indians, where I'm filming today in Santa Barbara County, um, have traditionally used this tree for thousands of years for the creation of burl bowls, using the large bumps on the trunk known as a burl to create these beautiful hardwood bowls. Now, Euro-Americans have also found use for this tree as uh, cabinet making material, veneers for hardwood floors, um, things that you can use a very durable trunk for. However, it's never really been commercially harvested because this tree grows in these long string out areas along riparian habitat. So um, that's a fortunate thing that it hasn't really been subjected to a huge amount of the timber industry. And of course, the value of trees is not limited to the materials that we can extract from them because sycamores also make a wonderful landscape tree. They have an aesthetic beauty to them, those light green leaves and those huge, beautifully modeled trunks. But in addition to that, these trees provide us with a huge amount of useful shade in the hot summer days that we get down here in California because of their large canopy and ginormous leaves, which is really handy if you're trying to stay cool down here when the weather gets toasty. And of course, those long horizontal branches also make for an absolutely wonderful climbing tree. So really the perfect tree to have in a landscape. One final human use for these trees is as storytellers. Trees vastly outlive human beings in most cases, and trees like the sycamore can live for over 400 years. Now this tree behind me here is at least 300 years old um, and dates to the time prior to the arrival of Europeans in this part of North America. Because trees store all kinds of information inside of their annual growth rings, the little rings inside of the trunk that show how the tree grew each year, we can learn so much about our history by looking at trees like this, even without cutting them down. Trees like this also serve as a gathering place for communities and have done so for hundreds of years in the case of this particular ancient sycamore here. Now, as might be expected because of how densely populated California is, sometimes humans are coming into conflict with the places that California sycamores would like to be growing. A lot of development impacts the way that these trees can grow. But remember, California sycamores prefer a very specific riparian habitat and so there's one type of development that is even more impactful than just your standard construction of houses, roads, and all the other what have you's of infrastructure. I am standing here in Franklin Creek, and Franklin Creek is in the town of Carpinteria, California, and it is an unfortunate example of one of the problems that western sycamores are facing today. If you look up and down this creek, you will notice that it is entirely constrained with concrete. And the reason for that is that when the neighborhoods around me here were developed, um, the, the developers decided to put these concrete barriers up to prevent the creek from filling its historic floodplain because they built in it and they don't want the water going into the houses, which is great for the houses, but unfortunately, it keeps the water here in this creek in a place that is inaccessible for tree roots because now, instead of soaking into the surrounding soil, filling the water table and raising aquifers, this water instead rushes straight out into an estuary and into the ocean without actually benefiting a riparian habitat on either side. And in fact, if you look down this creek here, you will notice that although we have some plants growing in the bottom of the concrete here, we don't really have any tall trees. Um, and in fact, we don't have much things to shade out the creek either, which is 
extremely detrimental for the fish living in here. It raises the water temperature. It reduces stream flows as well. And so um, this is one of those things that if we can fix this problem of the constrained creeks and allow them to flow a little bit more naturally once again, not only will we benefit our western sycamores that no longer have access to creeks like this, but we'll benefit a whole variety of wildlife that depend on these riparian habitats, which are, again, these super rich areas of life in this dry area of Southern California. Now, a slightly easier way to help the California sycamore that doesn't involve tearing out the concrete lining so many creeks is by planting them in our homes and gardens. Now, a lot of folks, when they're choosing a tree for their yard, will unfortunately choose a variety that is not native to the place that they live. But planting native plants has a whole lot of wonderful benefits. And the California sycamore actually does really well in a landscaped human setting. So choosing a tree like this for your home not only provides you the wonderful shade and other benefits they can give you, but it gives the native animals and plants that rely on this tree um, a chance at coming back and finding that tree in your yard and creating a little bit of wildlife habitat. The next time you're out in a riparian forest, take a look around and see if you can spot a California sycamore tree. And remember how this tree connects you with the rest of the environment. everybody. I hope you enjoyed this last tree video. If you want to learn a lot more about trees, you can keep up with this page by subscribing to it. And if you want to help it grow a little bit more, please consider sharing these videos out to more friends. Thanks so much for watching.